I guess we should have been say. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, That wasn't me waiting for a suggestion. That was me (laughs) letting you all shut up for a minute. (laughs) All right. Stop laughing. (laughs) This is the problem when you don't have visual cues. Yeah. Body language. It was a dramatic pause, but everyone just jumps in to fill that dead air space. We should put some. I think that makes a good start, personally. Let's roll with it. Draw a picture of a dramatic pause. (laughs) Yeah. So we just pick a point at which during this bit that we've been talking and then start there. Yeah. And not even introduce the damn thing. (laughs) Slow fade in. Why not? Slow fade. Yeah. Because I. It both. English words. It bothers me when songs fade out. Why? Because I always feel like if you're going to be able to write music, you should be able to write the end of the music. And there seems to be a large sort of section of the 80s and 90s where no song just ended. And they couldn't figure out how to stop looping this outro that they've got. So they just faded it out until everyone got bored. Yeah. And I think that's. I always used to wonder how they do that live. Exactly. Like, do they. Some bands I've seen will actually segue directly from one song into another by merging them together, and I think that's really cool. Um, but the only band I've seen do that, I think I've seen Radiohead and Jamiroquai both do that. Hmm. But both of those bands don't fade out that often. So they don't need to. They do it anyway, because they're skilled artists. And I think it's a, um, something that my parents sort of instilled in me, uh, uh, appreciation for skillful music. And I think that fading out a piece of music, or a, a song. I mean, pieces of music don't tend to fade out because if they're called a piece of music, they're better than that. Um, but fading out a piece of music is kind of uh, not that skillful. Yeah, yeah. I suppose it's kind of like when they have um, uh, comedy sketches and they just end it by saying, "We don't have an ending for this," or they just kind of finish. They don't have that punchline. That always annoys the crap out of me. Yeah, uh, in that case, that tends to be sort of a style of comedy. It's almost an irony that there is no actual joke here. And I think if done well, yeah. it has to be pretty good. Yeah, that can be a thing. But I tend to find, I don't know if it's like, I think of it a lot when I think of Saturday Night Live. You know, um, whenever you watch any of the sketches for that, they tend to just kind of end. And I suppose it, I always thought it was just a difference in, in humour, like between English and American kind of senses of humour, where we have punchlines we have a sketch build to a single payoff whereas they tend to just have like this is funny throughout and then it just kind of ends yeah and another thing that i get is when you're watching um american comedy in general but like sitcom rather than sketch comedy or anything and they can't figure out quite how to end a scene so they always (laughs) seem to end it on something that should have a badum tish but doesn't have a badum tish you know what i mean it's like they 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 have a scene which is pertinent to the story and then they they keep going until someone says something funny enough to end the scene on. And often that's very contrived. They started doing it a lot in the Big Bang Theory, which is kind of why I stopped watching it, because it's jumped the shark in some way. Um, whereas in the early scenes, in the early uh, episodes, the scenes would be natural and they'd end at a natural point because the, drive, the writers weren't quite so jaded about the, the work yeah. that they've been doing for the past 13 years. Anyway... <laughs> <laughs> not to not to shit all over the no. work of people that I have no but, hope I of I mean to be fair emulating. you're not trying to so fuck them are we going to be swearing on this by the way uh, like okay <laughs> yeah. cool apparently I, I don't care I just we'll discuss them yeah. now good <laughs> I mean I don't think I think swearing is fine done it I guess it it kind of depends on our target audience. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. But like we were talking about, but we were talking before about some of the topics we could potentially do in the future might not necessarily be uh, that under eighteen geared. So yeah, but we can have specific things that are over eighteen specific, as it were, and yeah. and then in general be a little bit more PG thirteen. Yeah, I'm, this is quite interesting. It's kind of like talking about a podcast Metacast. under construction while you're doing it. It's like living in a house. Yeah, you which build is why we, it's why we didn't introduce properly. Yeah, should we do it now? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we should do it after we've got the uh, 
at least some consensus on certain things okay. for example the name of it this sounds like a meta podcast right now which sounds like actually a pretty good name <laughs> the meta the meta cast <laughs> yeah i'm fine with it so, <laughs> well, like it. For the meta cast <laughs> that's where jen james and i talk about the podcast <laughs> rather than actually yeah, having a podcast <laughs> We talk about what we would talk about if we had a podcast, <laughs> but we don't, so we're not going to. Yeah. This is a hypothetical podcast, basically. Hypothetical podcast is quite a good one, too. I like that. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the hypothetical <laughs> podcast, <laughs> which started about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> yeah, Metapod Metacast is quite good. Uh, it slightly sounds like a Pokemon. Ah, Pokecast. Pokecast. <laughs> Uh, hyper, hypercast? No. Hypercast? Mm, hypercast. No, stay away from that. <laughs> Metacast, a uh, point of information. Metacast is an agile podcast delivered by agile practitioners focused on agile teams. Uh, Bob uh, Galen. Of course, <laughs> yeah. it's already a podcast. Why would a cool name for a podcast not have a stupid subject? behind it metacast no yeah like me metacast is Sorry, also a leading provider of weather graphic solutions <laughs> of course they are <laughs> that's the first thing that came to mind when you said metacast was oh weather <laughs> graphics yeah yeah what would you search for if you wanted internet graphics <laughs> i know right i hope you can't hear the sound of me drinking my delicious tea yeah while we I can while we're doing this ah oh, god I suppose the good thing about doing this with um, Discord and Craig is that you can just like mute individual channels. Yeah. So if I so it'd just be me and Jen start talking over you, you don't like the sound of what I'm <laughs> saying. You can just slowly fade me out. This is why you don't have a single point of editing in any in such situation. You have to trust <laughs> your editor. <laughs> I go and check out the podcast when you upload it, wherever you're going to upload it, and it's just I'm not even in it anymore. You're just taking me out completely. It would be an interesting uh, conversation. So there's a thing called Our Hypothetical Podcast by Kinky Fish Comedy on <laughs> iTunes. Casey Ellis and Patrick Volmer. So that already exists. <laughs> well. Great. All right, back to square one then. Well, the first podcast was one of the things on the itinerary was what the heck. It actually says what's it called, but I thought I'd flesh it out for the PG-13 audience. Uh, so answers on a postcard. I mean, what might help in naming it would be to do it the other way around. So what, what's it going to be about? What are we talking about? Uh, well, it's obviously associated with the UNI channel, hmm. um, but not necessarily intimately so. It's just the same people, basically. Like um, but because we all are into our games, hence having a... Hmm. Let's Play related YouTube channel in the first place. That seems like a good start. Um, so, what would you call a gaming podcast that hasn't been done already? And it's not necessarily going to be about gaming. That's probably just going to be a, a common theme. Yeah. I mean, you can still stick with, you know, you and I cast or something like that. Yeah. Well, I liked you and I say. Yeah. Hmm. It doesn't, doesn't portray the podcast nature of it, though. Well, I suppose it didn't have to. I mean, Metacast doesn't portray the non meta nature of an actual podcast, neither does hypothetical. Mm. I mean, people no. need to know that this is a real thing, not a meta thing or a hypothetical <laughs> thing. And yet, here we are discussing sort of. Uh, brain. James, fin finish that sentence for me. Uh, I literally can't. Well,. <laughs> Moving swiftly on, <laughs> that's point three. Anyway, what will this podcast be about? Good question. Yeah. Um, whatever we happen to get onto, so far we've already lambasted most people's tasting comedy and music. So yeah. today's podcast is about how we end things. Interesting. I was hoping that okay. everyone would just shut up for long enough for us to end the podcast. But... <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Hey, look, look, we just discussed this. You can just ignore my voice channel. Just <laughs> Yeah, I could just cut it there, couldn't I? 
Yeah, that could be the entire thing. Short podcast, only nine minutes on the timer. Nine minutes. Well, that's some. <laughs> We've got plenty of stuff to talk about. Yeah. Um, so for for those listening at home, or all... hi, mum, <laughs> one of you. <laughs> I've done show notes because I'm a huge nerd and I wrote down a bunch of stuff and we've been talking for 10 minutes and we haven't touched like hardly any of it. We haven't, we've so, done two of them out of. Yeah. Well, we've talked about, about 24. Them, or rather, you've read them out, but we haven't actually like solved it in any way. This is why it's more <laughs> of a meta cast because obviously we're talking about the options for talking about the podcast rather than discussing the things that are on the list of options. Maybe- is the yeah. metacast of the podcast meta, like the, the name meta... for this particular podcast if we ever air it it could be metacast like, like we're gonna give like um for most podcasts yeah, you have so. that's what i meant yeah yeah good talk <laughs> <laughs> what we've done here is we've chosen one person who forgets a lot of words and made them talk into a microphone with no visual or you know, body language clues. <laughs> it's going to be a fun series. Well, James, one of the things that you have suggested we mention is who are we? And we have yet yeah. to mention anything except for possibly our names. And I don't know if I, I did don't that. Think, I'm not even sure we've done all of those. <laughs> yeah, because you just said I rather than Al. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mi name is Al. I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, sure. There you go. That was the only Dutch I ever learned. Actually, the only Dutch I ever learned was me Janssen. Um, but it didn't apply to most situations that I found myself in. Um, because my name what does it mean? my name is not Frau Janssen. <laughs> my name is Mrs. Janssen. Oh. <laughs> well, you know, a deed poll is actually very affordable. Just you know, if you want to make that work, you can make that work. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, it's a bit of an investment, not financially, yeah. just more sort of the long term effect of all those things. I mean, I could change my name on Deedpod. In fact, I have in the past changed my name and I'm still experiencing the fallout of having to change literally everything I own to have my new name yeah. on it. I think only two years ago did I actually change my passport, six years yeah. after I changed my name because it was the first time I needed it. I think it ran out. It expired. And no one's checking that your passport has got your name on it because that is the gospel thing that tells people what your name is. So yeah. You just waltz through customs with a completely different name. And no one is any the wiser. Well, you can change your name at any point. Like, because um, I used to work in the depot office and you can just decide now, okay, my name is now something else completely. And legally, it's perfectly valid. The only problem is that you know, organizations out there like banks and stuff like that, they just want a paper trail and they want a paper trail that isn't just you writing, my name is now this and stamping it yourself. Like they want something to say that you used to be this person. There's some kind of through line here between this person and this person so that we can know they're not trying to defraud us or something like that. So like, I was always quite surprised when I actually got into that job, how meaningless a deep hole really is. Like it's, it's nothing official. There's no, huge database of these are all the names in England or whatever. You can just start calling yourself something else tomorrow. It really weirded me out. Plus you get some of the weirdos trying to change their name to like Optimus Prime and shit like that. But like you say, you couldn't just, I mean, there's nothing I can think of that I could change my name on that would not want some other proof, which has actually turned out to be a problem in the past because I used to drive to London a lot when I didn't have a car and therefore I would hire a car on a semi-regular basis. Um, but the first time, or in fact, two or three times that I tried to do that, they wanted some sort of proof of address and my name and all that sort of thing. And the only thing I had, like normally you would have a utility bill with your name on it or, you know, some sort of recent thing that was sent to your house with your name on it. But if they don't accept a council tax bill, which for some reason they don't, the only thing that I could get was a bank statement. But I'd recently signed up to paperless billing at paperless banking. So I didn't have any bank statements either, meaning that I literally had no way of proving that I lived well. Because at the time, I hadn't changed my driving license to be in the new house because I didn't trust myself to stay in that house for very long, which turned out to be the case. So having something like 
a deed poll is almost necessary because at some point you have to have a baseline for something that is you. If you change your name, no one's going to believe you changed your name until you've given 80 quid to some random part of the court to have a piece of information underlying everything so that you can start doing all that. Yeah, well, that's kind of what I mean. Like the deed poll is just a recognized proof of change of name, but it doesn't have to be it doesn't mean anything in and of itself like like say as far as the government's concerned you know concerned or the court system or whoever you're doing it it doesn't matter it's purely like forced upon us because of the organizations we have to deal with day to day but it makes it's a very weird thing it makes sense that we'd have to that we could just change our name in any of those organizations as the paper trail that the deed poll fulfills so if i wanted to change my name on a bank account if I, they, I understand that they wouldn't let me open a new bank account with a new name because there was no proof of that person ever having existed. And worst of all, that person has no credit score. But if I wanted to change my name on a bank account, that should be trivial because they know it was me. Yeah. And at that point, there is some paper trail somewhere. So then the bank starts doing um, credit lookups against your new name, for example, and then the credit agencies know that your new name is linked to your old name and then new banks know that that because if you look at your credit score now they know way more about you than you've ever told them <laughs> you can follow your i always forget my um my previous addresses because i keep moving house until recently so all of a sudden there's this paper trail like you keep saying in digital format in some organization's database and i've never even used that organization it sort of accidentally got there from other like things like banks and things doing it they know more about my previous addresses than i do yeah it's very weird i had recently i was doing um my ucas application for university um unnecessarily it turned out but I, when i was doing it i couldn't remember when i did uh, an english a level part-time course that i did a few years ago and i found out by going and looking on facebook like <laughs> The records of our lives are out there in the weirdest ways. And I found it on Facebook, not because I'd written anything on Facebook, because I thought, ah, oh, I remember that on the first day, I was the day that I made Facebook friends with this person. So I just went and looked up when we became first friends on Facebook. And that was the day that I started the course. <sighs> yeah, that was weird. I mean... I have similar problems with dates because um, the age difference between Jen and I means that oftentimes Jen was still in primary school when I'm talking about stuff that <laughs> I remember. And it occurred to me, I don't know when I finished school and I don't know when I started doing Yeah, those dates just go. Yeah, I have no recollection of those things. I remember yeah, doing I them. I have to think really hard about these things. It's very weird. The only thing I really remember is that I was still, I think I was doing A-levels when the Millennium showed up. And that's about probably true <laughs> I'm not quite <laughs> sure you know i remember getting windows i remember getting a pirated copy of windows xp from a guy at school you know that's that's the extent that my timeline of my past is linked to anything else that ever happened is that windows xp was kind of new and i was at school jen's been making all these noises but i can individually just blank them out so i've not been mentioning them but we're waiting for something <laughs> to happen i'm not entirely convinced jen can hear us i can she can. Well, why don't you say something? I'm getting like a lot of background noise. She's sliding around. She can't sit still. It's because I'm really uh, hungry and I haven't eaten. So I'm looking why haven't you eaten? You went to Sainsbury's. I mean, the magic of editing, we could take a break and come back. Sorry. Yeah, we could do. Well, it has been half an hour. 20 minutes. It has been 20 minutes. <laughs> Not that I'm climbing or anything. We could do a fade out into... Um, oh, what's that chap's name? He does uh, open... Uh, Creative Commons music and Avac uses his stuff a lot. What's his name? It's a really annoying name. Creative Commons. This is the best thing about um, doing this on Discord is I can just search for stuff. Hmm. Except I can't find the chap's name. Uh, but yeah, we used to use him in our Cataclysm videos that Ed and I did way back when. That was actually in the house that I was complaining about just earlier. So I might have the name in the um, thing, but I was thinking we could fade out and have like a brief interlude like they used to do in the Goon Show. <laughs> things like that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Cool. Uh, so 
let's fade out now just while we keep talking. In fact, since we don't know how to end this section, we should fade out because let's just loop this same bit of conversation over and over again, fade it out into some music. And then we'll come back when Jen's had a sandwich and can stop squirming around and making background noises, distracting everybody, causing us to talk about stuff that the people who are listening to the podcast can no longer hear. Yes. Sure. Or well, yeah. Sure. Okay. See you after this not music that we're probably not going to do. Is anybody else looking over at the list of people on air as though that was the people you were talking to, trying to make eye contact with circles? Um, no. no. Is it because it's not actually visible on your screens? Yeah. No, it is. Although now I'm doing I keep it. keep looking so... across at the monitor. Thanks. It's probably because I want to make sure that I'm not talking at the same time as somebody else. Because if it's a circle, you stop talking, right? But yeah. it also feels a little bit like that's the the camera, as it were, that's where I'm talking to people at. Now that I'm looking at it, my circle keeps going green when I'm not saying anything. So yeah. Up a load of like me heavy breathing <laughs> down the mic or something. It's not, um, I'm not hearing things. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll edit that out and then people will be going, what did you edit out? <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that in for your enjoyment. You have so much power in this situation. I'm not sure <laughs> how I didn't realize how vulnerable this would make me feel. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed the brief interlude that we may or may not have had. Honestly, that completely depends on how lazy I am and whether I can sort of override what I think people will say when I choose the song to go in the middle. Because there's a lot of options. This Kevin McLeod person is actually really good, and he does require that you... Well, he's been alive for quite a long time, so he's probably had quite a lot of music under his belt. Are you making the Highlander joke that you made whilst we were off I camera? I am. <laughs> off air. I'm making the Highlander joke. Um, I'm really proud of myself. Yeah, good job. I mean, we had to explain it for people to get. Look, how long have you known me? Do you think I ever care about explaining a joke? Possibly. Or if anyone else ever laughs, laughs at it. I know that that's true, but I, when I make a joke that other people don't get, and that's on purpose, it's because I want to see them not get it. I want to see the look on their face <laughs> as they are not getting this joke. Oh, uh, you're so right, actually. I hadn't thought of it like that before, but you are 100% So when correct. it's a podcast like this, uh, it, it loses a lot of its luster, not being able to see the expressions on people's faces as they try and work out whether it was a joke <laughs> and what it was a joke on in the first place. See, that's all the sweetest. Like, I love nothing more. Like, one of my favourite practical jokes I ever heard about was uh it's probably quite a well-known one by now but the idea of when you're redecorating your house when you take the old wallpaper off just paint i will kill again on the wall and then put your wallpaper back up so that when you move house or whatever you know 20 years down the line someone else is going to redecorate and find that that really tickles me i did that actually recently um a friend of mine <laughs> there was a photo of him doing pole dancing which is you know, fine, great. But it was a bit of a funny photo and we, everyone had a bit of a chuckle at it. And then he wasn't embarrassed by it or anything, but it was just a funny photo. So I printed out 50 copies of it and hid them all around the gym <laughs> that we go to. So, um, and in places that people will not find them for 10 years, like places like inside sealed boxes, like in through little cracks in sealed boxes. So no one ever will see them until that box falls apart or gets taken apart. And I just, oh, it makes me happy in my soul. <laughs> the idea that 10 years from now, someone's going to find one of these pictures and not even know who it is and just be like, huh? And that's it. That's the entire reaction. But it, oh, it makes me so happy. <laughs> it's like there's a, there's a, it, there's, what am I trying to say? People often do things for the immediate gratification of it. It's like the opposite of altruism. In fact, there's a big debate as to whether altruism is even a real thing because it can always be traced back to the selfish desire to want to feel good for having done something good, right? But yeah. wanting to do something that you will never see the the comeuppance of, you'll never see the punchline of that joke. And the punchline of that joke is so boring. <laughs> People will not even laugh at it. They'll go, what's this? <laughs> and throw it away. Or maybe they'll recognize that person because for some reason there's a tentative connection between the people 10 years down the line who opened that box and the fact that that guy was at the gym at some point and they you know, probably still know each other for some reason. You go, oh, I remember that. Ha ha ha. And 
you know, maybe it'll maybe it will encourage them to get back in contact. You never know. Maybe. Maybe sometime, some point down the line, everyone's lost touch with everybody else and everything's fallen apart. No one's talking to each other. And they go, oh, I remember that. It was pretty funny. Is he funny? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. So people go, I remember that guy. We had some laughs. And then get back in contact. Facebook will still be around because it's immutable now. Yeah. Much like all supernatural forces in the universe. Uh, uh, and, you know, it will enrich somebody's future life. That's kind of the best case. The the. I'd like most, to say that's why I did it. But the most likely case is it's just going to be a very humdrum, mediocre reaction to a picture that was printed out on a printer that is no doubt going to be dated when you actually come to <laughs> open the thing. It's like looking at 80s photos now. Do you, ever, do you look at photos of yourself as a kid? The ones no. that had to be developed properly from film? Well, a, a few. I try and avoid all photos of myself. Because, well, <laughs> you all, knew yeah. me when I was young. Why would anyone want to look at that? But you see things, or at least photos from that era, you know, late 80s, early 90s sort of era. And I think what gets me, and here's one, actually, it's not that long ago. I saw a picture of, um, I think it was from 2003, of the skyline where the, the Twin Towers used to be. Hmm. And I wasn't particularly young in 2003. I was old enough to be forming opinions and memories of my own. You know, I was about, wait, I can work this out. I was 20. <laughs> so, because <laughs> of 1983. Well, I would have been 19 at the time because my birthday's at the end of the year, but you get the idea. Um, I was about 19, 20 at the time when that photo was taken, but I don't remember photos looking that bad. Yeah. But now that we see modern photos with all the high res, you know, billions of pixels, high color definition stuff. You look at an old photo and it's slightly blurry and washed out and, you know, the colour reproduction is weird. And you go, photos never look that bad. Every time I've ever looked at a photo, it's just looked like what I thought it was. Hmm. But in fact, old photos look shit. <laughs> <laughs> Even from 2003 when we had digital cameras. Yeah. Well, that was kind of like the early days of digital cameras, I assume. Yeah. So it's like, you know, um, the jump between like... Uh, no, no, mind. It's gone completely. But if I was going to say, if you go back and look at like non HD TV these days, it looks dreadful. It's it like unwatchable, <laughs> and you're watching it just like, how did we not see how bad this was? But it's just because you didn't have anything to compare it to. Well, I remember watching things in HD when it was fairly new for things to be broadcast in HD, and I was watching films. And I don't like watching this film because it's too good quality. Yeah. It almost felt like I was um, in the studio whilst they were recording it. It made me lose all sense of, um, uh, what's the word? You know, when you're, when you're in the scene. You like know, immersion. You, immersion. I lost all sense of immersion because the cameras felt like they were moving on rails and the like they were just doing a pantomime. Yeah. Because it was so high quality. And that was really the only difference because it wasn't a film I'd seen before. So, you know, it's not a perfectly scientific uh, study that I'm doing here. But at the same time, I've watched many films and not once have I held, had that feeling, except maybe on purpose. And yet, just by watching in HD, I'm going, I don't like this. I can't watch it. I hate it. And now and mean? it's, it's completely like the opposite. Happened. It's like a gloss or a shine to something when it's too good. Yeah. And you, you can't see through that. I like when you can tell... I'm finding it hard to articulate it, but I know exactly what you mean. Like when you can tell that something's CGI. Yeah. Because it doesn't quite look grubby enough to be real. Yeah, it's just slightly too perfect. But I had a similar culture shock when we first got broadband. Oh, yeah? Because at the time... When when we had broadband, obviously before that, we were using modem, which would connect to 48K because everything is a bigger number on paper than it is in reality. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, that meant that I could only use it for an hour a day. Otherwise, we'd tie up the phone line. And no one could contact us or call out. Um, so I would do absolutely everything that I needed to do on the internet in that hour. You know, I'd play half an hour of Quake 2 online with massive ping, so I couldn't actually do it um and i would 
go to every single website that I want you to know anything about. In fact, I would probably open lots of windows at the time we didn't have tabbed browsing. So you'd open mm. lots of Internet Explorer windows, download every web page that you were going to want to read in that hour, <laughs> fill the rest of the hour up with gaming, close the Internet, and then read all the things that you downloaded, yeah. do everything that didn't require the Internet except for that one hour of time. And then we installed our broadband. There, we had our broadband connection installed for us. Obviously, we didn't install ourselves, but all of a sudden, I could look things up at the point that I needed to know it. Yeah, which was weird as all hell because I used to do lots of um, like fan art and things for the games that I play. I used to do backgrounds, and I was just playing around with three D software, that sort of thing. Part of which was photoshopping the things that I'd done. Yeah, and having Photoshop or 3ds Max or whatever I was using open, and then having the internet available at the same time was such a weird feeling that I actually couldn't get used to it. I still did things in segmented time slots. Huh. I had internet time and not internet time until I got used to the idea that I could just alt tap from the help to the to the program and back, and then continue to talk to people because at the time we were using ICQ. And um, what's ICQ? ICQ. <laughs> oh my god. Um, it's ICQ. <laughs> um, but it was the three letters ICQ, <laughs> mm-hmm. and it meant ICQ, and it was just a very early uh, IM program. Oh, okay. Predated Hangouts, and uh, it was I think it predated MSN Messenger, actually. Yeah, I think it was one of the earliest ones. I remember talking of all this stuff, like talking of tab browsing, I kind of had tab browsing because back at that kind of time, when we first started talking to each other, I was on, we were on AOL and you had the AOL browser, which was kind of like this little contained thing. Mm. And you opened windows within that. So I actually did have tab browsing like way before it came to anything else of a sort. I remember my dad. I mean, it was crap, but. I remember my dad got really angry when we had free serve because that was one of those ISPs that would only charge you the phone rate. Yeah. Um, and and when, he, he, when we installed whatever it was that we had to install, because you always have to install stuff on Windows for some reason, um, it changed the heading of Internet Explorer to say Internet Explorer provided by FreeServe. Yeah. And he got... I've never seen anyone get so angry over something that seems so trivial. I mean, <laughs> now that I've spent a lot of time in software and on the internet all that thing, you sort of see where the, the relation is. That first of all, this was not provided by FreeServe. This was provided by the fact that I bought Microsoft Windows and Internet Explorer comes with Microsoft Windows. Um, but then there's the idea that by connecting to the internet, it's gone in and done something so invasive, it could have done something else. Yeah. Which is where a lot of security problems come in. There's no... I mean, um, in if this was a people, you call it safeguarding. You wouldn't allow that thing to get access to that yeah. data because it's extremely dangerous to allow that boundary to be crossed. But Dad just got really crossed that it changed <laughs> something. <laughs> I was going to say, is that why your dad was crossed with it? But was he just crossed because he, I don't know, felt it was some kind of invasion? Um, I think that mostly he was crossed just because it happened. But you can see, it, it, I almost think that those things are probably like subconscious yeah. reasons rather than the actual reasons. You couldn't have explained it necessarily unless he was particularly into security and stuff, which I've never really talked to him about because Dad stopped doing software development kind of before I started. Yeah. There was about, about two or three years of crossover and we didn't even like use the same languages or anything, so... I never really spoke to him about it, except for at university. And then it was all because I was trying to learn it and didn't understand yeah. anything. You should try. Like, I'm sure there's some fascinating stories from, like, I love stories of, like, the old, the, oh, the old days. That's a terrible way of saying it. But, like, how they did things in the, the early days of programming and, and software and things like that. Like, because they had to almost be a lot more uh, crafty to kind of get around a lot of the limitations of the hardware. Yeah, I mean, one of the, the place that um, Dad worked before he lost his job and gave up on software entirely was a place that I did my sandwich year work uh, in the first place, um, which was a place doing apps for mobile phones before smartphones. 
So this was in the time when we had the Java phones and it's like 3330, uh, just, and then a bit later when we started having color screens and things. Um, but they were still very limited devices. They had very limited CPU, they had very limited memory. And we had a whole library of software of, of um, it was C++. And there was this massive library of things that we could use, each of which had very subtly different ways of doing the exact same thing using different amounts of memory. So everything was a trade-off. Whereas these days, you just have one type of everything and you throw as much memory as you need at it and don't give a shit. Yeah. Even on, even on mobiles. You know, we can now on smartphones, we can have web pages that have more functionality than the applications we were painstakingly writing for those, um, those pre-smartphone devices. Yeah. And that's within my lifetime. That's within my adult lifetime that yeah. we've had devices that you couldn't take advantage of and you had to sort of tiptoe around. It still blows my mind when you think of uh, when, like, the first smartphone as we think of it these days, which I think was the iPhone, like, came out. It was crazy recent, but you kind of forget that. You think it's always been there. But, like, I remember being at work when I was, what, 21, 22, so only seven or eight years ago, and still having, like, um, a T9 keypad on my phone. Like, yeah. And I think I could get on the internet on that one, but it was... It was slight, it was basically teletext. Like it was wax. Yeah. It was crap, yeah. <laughs> I remember um it was whilst I was working at Love Film, so it would have been two thousand two thousand eight to two thousand and nine. And I was coming home on the bus for some reason, probably because of trains as usual. Um and I was gonna be late, super late because of all this faffing around on buses and I didn't know where to go because I'd never been on a bus before because I usually got the tube. Um, trying to use Facebook on a Java phone, it was a slidey phone. So it had the T9 keypad behind it so that most of the front of the phone was the screen, except for the little button that you use to navigate. So it was like a square with four direction buttons. And in the middle, there was a clicky button that also moved around. Yeah, and then you slid the phone apart vertically, and then there was a T9 keyboard behind it, and it was that was like one of the most advanced phones that was around at the time because I spent my new job money on getting an awesome new phone, and I couldn't figure out the internet was too slow to use Facebook, even though Facebook had a dedicated WAP Facebook version that would be minimal data, and all I wanted to do was send a message through Facebook tell people that I was going to be home super late and to have dinner without me. Hmm. And that was in 2009, which is yeah. not even a decade ago. Yeah, it's bizarre. It's really bizarre. And yet, we think of these things as having been around forever. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking this the other day, that I am glued to my phone. Like, I'm, I don't mean I'm looking at it all the time, but it doesn't leave my side pretty much 24-7. Like it goes yeah. on charge on my bedside when I'm sleeping. I wake up, it goes in my pocket, and it's just it's with me, twenty four seven. There's some really interesting stuff actually. TfL did some, you know, they've got Wi-Fi on some of the tube stations now. They tracked uh, a lot of stuff about how people move and kind of how they travel to look at you know advertising, but also congestion in stations and things like that. Really interesting read. But the thing it made me realise is that the phone just being in my pocket, not even using it, just being in my pocket. It's got all these sensors in it. So much stuff about me is being broadcast out there now. Um, it's really weird. And it's not even that I particularly mind. Like, I, I'm i not um, a stickler for privacy or that stuff. I'm not saying, you know, broadcast to the world, but I don't really care if TfL knows the route I took through King's Cross Station. But it is still something that you stop and think about I just go, huh, yeah, the, the world's changed. There's actually some fairly good articles on the dangers of that sort of information being available. Yeah. Because the fact that TfL can do it is fairly innocuous, and you kind of expect TfL not to be too, you know, well, yeah, actually, your data. To their credit, they were really, um, like, in a lot of the reports that they gave out about it, they were one of the big things that they really worked on was 
privacy and information. The, the big thing apparently was just if you tell people you're doing it, people are aware of it ahead of time or exactly what it entails. People are a lot more okay with it. People would have been a lot more upset about it, I think, if they'd done it and then not told anyone and then the data just came out. Um, I'm trying to find the link to send to you, but I can't. But it's... So I seem to remember there was a story about... Because you, you remember there was um, a big hoo-ha about collecting metadata about phone calls. And it was uh, a yeah, privacy like... concern. And they said, we're not collecting the contents of the phone calls. We're connecting, collecting data about the phone calls. So it's metadata. But the metadata was sufficient to identify men who are having affairs. Oh, shit. So even metadata like that, even your you know, movement through the underground network could be used, in theory, to find out things about you that are not just targetable by advertisers, but uh, could be used as blackmail. I mean, probably having an affair is something that you might consider is a problem between that person and his wife or husband. But then, you know, it's easy to get into the debate, just talk to each other. And if you're having problems in your relationship, do it the grown-up way. But grown-ups are not, unfortunately, grown-ups. Um, and that's just one example. So there are many other things, um, one of which is people who are trying to disassociate themselves from their past. Mm. Uh, like in in a lot of cases the the problem in fact with google plus requiring your real name was mostly a problem of privacy because a lot of people on google plus didn't want to be found by people that they had forcibly disassociated themselves it's also the a general safeguarding issue for like domestic violence abuse survivors and all that sort of thing yeah exactly I mean, one of the people I knew on Google Plus, well, when they changed the thing, she came onto Google Plus because she couldn't use Google Plus without being discovered from a previous abusive relationship. Yeah. Or, or family, I forget. So I suppose we should actually talk a little bit about ourselves. Jen here actually <laughs> knows a lot about this sort of thing, safeguarding. And um, Jen, how would you describe it? Um. So I specialize in safeguarding um, vulnerable adults and young people. Um, it's one of my <laughs> main things I do in all of my work. So that means like domestic abuse, um, domestic violence, um, young people who have mental health issues, marginalized young people, so queer young people, um, child abuse survivors, all that sort of thing. And it's been very interesting because um, Jen and I have been together for a few months now, and Jen's come up with a lot of things, well, not come up with, but taught me about a lot of things that you would not expect to be sort of vectors for this sort of thing to get into people's lives. Mm. So whenever you watch something on, on uh, TV, like say there's new legislation about something or other, and you hear that there's some people kicking up a fuss about it, and you go, what are you kicking up a fuss about that for? Um, it It's fine until then you hear how these things that seem trivial from like a political or like from a personal point of view, like you wouldn't have thought of it yourself, can actually affect people in these vulnerable situations in ways that you would never have considered. But as soon as someone tells you, you go, that's actually really mm -hmm. like the Google one, where you go, if you have to put your real name on something and they're going to audit it, then people who are running away from people are going to have their real name plastered all over the internet and it leaks out like that. Yeah, and the whole Facebook thing, um, with Facebook making you have your real name and stuff was such a huge deal. Even like trans people and people who had changed their names and stuff. And we were talking earlier about name changes and depot and stuff. And Facebook were really shit with all of that. Um, like you had to use the name that you could provide on a birth certificate or a passport or something. And like for so many people, like who were hiding from something or managed to escape like domestic violence or child abuse or anything along those lines even but also people like teachers and nurses and people who just worked with other people who needed a certain level of privacy for safeguarding reason couldn't then like the number of teachers who then had to just come off Facebook because they couldn't use a pseudonym because like even I got stalked when I changed my name to my real name on Facebook by a young person. It, the, the thing I find interesting about that 
kind of stuff is. Like the one of the more common kind of um, not arguments, but things people say when, when that kind of stuff comes up is, well, we just don't use it. It's only Facebook. Like they're, they're a private company. They can do what they they can demand of you what they want to use their product. And if you don't want to meet that demand, then don't use their product. But it's now becoming the point to the point where not being able to use Facebook is actually almost seriously detrimental to somebody's life. It, it can be, uh, you know, a communication channel, but it means that they're missing out on a lot of things, whether that's, you know, um, within their own social circle of friends, like talking and sharing things, or even just hearing about, you know, the next big viral video, they miss out on that because they just don't see it go around Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been getting to a point where these services like Facebook and Twitter and things are almost becoming the equivalent of things like, um, you know, the internet itself or, you know, having heating or things like that. It's just where you need these things in your life in order to participate in society. There does seem to come a point where um, something, the argument is that it's a private company and on a very technical level, that's quite right. But at some point, this thing that is, uh, that was originally a private service for people to use in a specific way sort of goes through a, a metastasis, 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 anyway, where it is no longer that private company just because it's a private company is now a social phenomenon and they have a social responsibility because they are a focal point for the whole, the whole society. It's like saying that the council doesn't have a social responsibility. Yeah. There's a, there's a word I'm trying to think of or a phrase. It's not, you know, human right. It's not quite on that level, but it, it's things like how um, the internet itself is viewed or, or phone lines where it's, it's something like, um, uh, protect, protected utility or necessary utility or something like that, where it's getting to the point where you need these things. Like even things like fairly soon, it's going to get to the point where you're going to need your Facebook ID to actually do things like prove who you are. You know, Facebook ID might become a valid form of ID. In which case, if you can't then use Facebook because you don't want to meet the demands that they place on you, you're now missing out on potentially being able to use whatever service is requiring your Facebook ID to let you sign on for it. They, they kind of switch from being um, services provided by private companies to being necessary. Um, and it's it's the same thing that they're, you know, with um, telephone lines and things like that, where they're, oh, I can't remember the phrase. It's really annoying me. But do you see what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, it, it becomes cultural. Yeah. And societal rather than social. It is part of the Western culture and in probably all the other cultures too, but I don't know how the uptake is in other countries. It's not just everyone in England that's all over it. It's everyone in America. It's everyone in Europe. It's every, I mean, as far as I know, it's all over South America as well. As far as I know, it's all over Japan, even probably China, because it seems like one of the things that the Chinese government has a control over, but still allows in, like Google. Hmm. Um, it's, you know, it's probably as important as Google. Not being able to Google something is as bad as not being able to get people on Facebook. Yeah. Did you hear, um, so recently they're talking about um, how internet access affects human rights and the UN have basically said that internet access is a human right. Yeah. I think they said so a couple of years ago. Mm. Well, you see it in things like the Arab Spring and stuff like that. Just the ability to communicate en masse makes the, the biggest difference. Yeah, and the thing about the internet is it doesn't just make... It's not just because it makes communication easy, because the phone did that, Yeah. but it makes accidental communication easy. Yeah. You can communicate to people you weren't trying to reach. Yeah, it's you not, it's not targeted. You can broadcast out and people yeah. find you. It's almost as much as... It's like a combination of phone and TV. Everyone gets the opportunity to broadcast stuff, which means everyone needs the ability to you know, have the ability to put things out rather than just receive. Yeah. Because in TV, obviously, you can only receive. And with a phone, you can go both ways. Um, but with the internet, you can, like, we are going to broadcast this. Yeah. Everything that we've said here can be listened to by literally anybody who has the internet connection uh, and who isn't behind some firewall that prevents it. Like, possibly people in China may not be able to. And Korea. Um, yeah, naughty Korea. Yeah. <laughs> but... 
otherwise, the only barrier between the things that we've said now at you know quarter past eight on a Tuesday night and everybody in the world is one of discovery. All they have to do is discover it. Yeah. And at that point, things start being ideas spread. And that's what we're trying to do. That's a really interesting way of putting it. Like the only barrier is finding it. Yeah. Whereas previously the barrier had to be the technology to you know, be able to receive it. Like yeah. TV channels in the UK, we used to only have four and then five TV channels. So discovering stuff was a case of I'm bored. What's on one, two, three, four, five, nothing. I'm leaving. Yeah. <laughs> but now it's a case Channel 5 launched, man. That was an exciting time. Yeah, because we could receive it in Manchester. Yeah. Not everyone could. <laughs> I didn't know there um, was ever a time of four channels. So it was oh, so young. Long. <laughs> so young. So when I was a kid, we already had Freeview and all that. Uh, yeah. Spoiler. Well, there's going to be there's going to be kids these days, like my new niece, who's going to be going, it, how did it work? Sorry. You know, like we think about um, the old board modems. I went to a, a a computing museum once, which is kind of sort of thing that sounds really nerdy, but is obviously really interesting because we are nerds. Uh, and they had a modem. It was one of the very first modems, and you literally put the phone receiver into the modem, <laughs> and it would send data through the the audio ability of the phone. Wow! Before the modem itself was able to create, to digitize the data. I mean, the phone itself essentially, I don't want to say digitizes, but it electrifies the data, right? It, it uses um, piezoelectric devices to turn audio into electric impulses, which are analog, and then does the opposite back again. So before the modem itself was able to synthesize the correct signals, it just made noises down the phone. And it could do like 72 bits per second. And it was amazing. Yeah. Wow. And then, you know, the actual, when they invented a, a faster modem, the ability to directly convert into the electricity meant they could do a lot faster. And now we don't even do that. We use digital rather than analog in the first place. But seeing this giant 70s phone, it was almost surreal. You know, it was almost like um, having a, an apple instead of a head with a bowler hat on top. It was almost a, a urinal on the wall sort of thing. It was so surreal just seeing this head handset off the hook and plugged into this, because it's a huge one. You know, like the ones you see in old films? Yeah. Like the massive ones that are bigger than your face. Just shoved onto this device and entirely used to send data from one computer to another. It was amazing. Yeah. I can't remember how I got onto that. I've, uh, I've thought of a possible name for the podcast. Oh, yeah. The Tangent Cast. <laughs> the Tangent Because <laughs> we have been incapable of talking about what we actually intended to talk about at any single point, I think, tonight. I'm pretty sure that was the point. Yeah. You could call it like tangentially relevant or something. Yeah. Although I've, I think Tangent Cast, I've just Googled and it exists already. Damn it. Uh, there's going to be a lot of things that already exist. Yeah. But we can use these names. And I wanted to talk about this on the podcast because if, God forbid, anyone actually listens to it, we can get feedback from the people who actually listen to it. Uh, which, let me just say, on a tangent, um, please, if you have listened to this podcast, and if you haven't, you won't be getting this message. So, okay, let's put it like this. If you did listen to the podcast, please leave feedback. We're always happy to, uh, you know, we want to learn. This is our very first podcast. And even though it was a rehearsal, I think I'm actually going to upload it. Um, oh, and God. If you didn't li listen to this podcast, can you please not leave feedback? <laughs> if you didn't listen to it, I suspect that you are sort of a, you're below the barrier to entry, and we want to get you know real data from real people. So if you're a bot, Craig, I don't want to hear your opinion. <laughs> God damn it, Craig! Craig, by the way, for the listeners at home or wherever you are, listeners on the bus. Um, is a Discord bot. So we're recording this over Discord, uh, which I assume everybody's going to know what Discord is because the only people who are going to listen to this are people I'm going to spam in Discord to please <laughs> listen to our podcast. Um, but it's a pretty cool bot because you put it in a channel and it records each thing individually. So That's I think uh, one thing we've definitely learned from this is a combination of using Discord to hear each other, but also to have that 
who's talking uh, the little green lights and then record locally to have a good quality. Yeah, I mean, like, I've got Audacity running now and it doesn't seem to have, it seems to be having no problem recording both at the same time. So I assume that's a viable way to do it. I haven't listened back to it yet, obviously, but. Yeah, I mean, we'll give it a go. Also, we seem to have some room acoustics problems. Yeah. And finally, we seem to have nothing for Jen to talk about. <laughs> I'm here, I'm here. She's here, she's here. <laughs> It's much easier to just listen to me and James talk shit for an hour than to try and we've actually had, have an opinion on any of it. We've had so much practice at it, that's the thing. Don't let us like walk all over you, Jen. Butt in. It does happen at dinner as well. Like whenever we go out to eat, we just talk forever and then people are like, Can I just say no? Yeah. Keep <laughs> people down, shove a taco in their mouth. Shut the hell up. I felt I felt a little bad when you came along to that my leaving dinner for work when uh I just spent the whole night talking to you and you were on the end of the table. So I just spent the whole time with my back to everyone else talking <laughs> to you. Well, that's fine because I had nothing to say to anybody else. Yeah. I think for me it's interesting because I'm used to recording with a camera in front of me rather than my laptop. Um, oh, la di da. It's very different. I am used to being on television, dude. <laughs> Not necessarily television, just camera. Different. Yeah. <laughs> What's that for? Like, um, yeah. television. All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. Um, no, I. So as a kid, I did film and television, and then kind of still do some acting stuff um, and get interviewed a lot. So um, okay. most recently, radio, and they shove a camera. Like the global studios are really cool. Um, LBC specifically have like these motion sensor cameras that follow you around. Um, and on Capital, they just have hand cameras where someone's operating it behind the thing. When was your last interview then? My last interview, that hmm. was, might have been global actually, was on Capital for um, the Global's, oh, what was it called? Big 40 or something, their charity day. Um, and they made so much money for us. It was really cool. Um, yeah, I think that was the last one, actually. So it's been a little while, but still. Listeners would probably appreciate background information that Jen runs a charity. Oh, uh, yeah. Or benefits from charity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I run a charity. And I, um, um, I represent a couple of other charities. So I work with the Big 40 Day was for um, a charity that I am the like youth representative for and I so I go and do media things and cool stuff and get interviewed by uh, Emma Bunton. Mm. The real Emma Bunton. Yeah. Who lives around the corner from me. The Bunt, as she's known. When you say around the corner, is that a London round the corner? No, literally you go straight down the road and turn right and she lives down there. <laughs> <laughs> Round in a literal corner. Yeah. Do you call around? <laughs> no, I don't know which house is hers. Ends. I just know she lives on that road. So does Justin Bieber. Uh, oh, that what? road. Yeah. Justin Bieber lives in London. Yeah, Justin Bieber in the last few months bought a house around the corner from me. It... Which is why Jen is trying to leave London. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> there was a lot of uproar about him moving in here. Uh... How, how is he as a neighbour? Um, to be honest, I don't really hear much. Um, I think he doesn't. <laughs> I don't suppose he spend that spends that much time here, to be honest. But um, yeah, it doesn't seem to cause too many problems. Speaking of charitable causes, mm. just looking at this new humble bundle that Dee wanted to buy. Humble? What um, is this? The thing that just got added to the notes a little while ago. Yeah. You know? What is it? Um, so the Humble Bundle was originally, and kind of still is, a collection of indie games in a pay-what-you-want sort of way. Um, and I think the proceeds went... You decided where the proceeds went. They had charities that they supported, and you could choose to put the money towards the developers if you chose, and then it would portion your the, the amount you paid based on the amount that you asked to go to each place. Um, and it's 
become a lot bigger since. I can't remember what was in the first Humble Bundle, but I definitely bought it. I think I might have had Kerbal Space Program, and I still have that, so that was pretty good. Um, but the current one is collecting money for the, the ACLU, the IRC, but not the one where you talk to people, and the MSF. Uh, I think the ACLU are the people who are currently living in airports in America trying to get people into the country who should be yeah, in the it's country. the American Civil Liberties Union, I think, something like that. I don't recognize the other two. The IRC and the MSF. So I think they're all basically helping people out in the States right now because... Well, MSF is Doctors Without Borders. Oh, yes, I know that now. And the IRC is International Rescue Committee, apparently. Oh, so, yeah. you know, pretty good causes. So it's a $30 bundle this time rather than being pay what you want. I was looking at it thinking I might get it because it has nuclear threat. Now it says this title is sold out for new customers. Okay, and look, as much as I understand what the ACLU are doing, uh, I know Médecins Sans Frontières are fairly ubiquitously a good thing to give money to. If I'm not going to get nuclear thrown out of this, I ain't playing. <laughs> <laughs> I've got half of these games. You know, it's got Invisible Ink in it. That's a good game. I've already got it. It's got World Goo. Already finished it. Stanley Parable. Already own it. The only things that I don't actually own and kind of want are out of stock. How, how can you be out of stock on digital stuff? Well, I assume like they have like a limit to how many they can sell that they've yeah, donated the to the bundle. People who make Nuclear Throne put a limit on their charity. Well, this other game says we are out of Steam keys for new customers. So I'm guessing That's Steam... Yeah. So I'm guessing the people where they get the games from give them so many digital... Well, Super Meat Boy is unlockable. made by the same... Super Meat Boy is made by Edmund McMillan, who did Isaac. Oh, I did not know that. Which is why there's a cube of meat <laughs> as an item. In, in You can make a Super Meat Boy when you get four cubes of meat, as you have successfully done so yourself. Yeah. Uh, Super Meat Boy is actually a pretty fun little uh, puzzle platformer, I think you call it, where you have to go fast and jump at the right time and collect things on the way and not die. It's pretty interesting, pretty fun. Um I don't need it, but, you know, Steam Keys for New Customers, you can get the game DRM-free, which is the whole point of the Humble Bundle, was that the games were indie games, pay what you want, put some of the money to charity, and they were DRM-free. What does DRM-free so mean? Of... So DRM is Digital Rights Management, ah. which is uh, usually turned into Digital Restrictions Management, because DRM is the thing that Sony started putting on CDs and things like that to stop you from copying it, basically. Mm. As you can imagine, it works 0% because the crowdsourcing cracking of encryption is much easier than actually applying the encryption in the first place. So anything that was encrypted with DRM to date, I believe, has been cracked by you know having millions of computers on the internet available to try to do so. Uh, but it's a matter of freedom. People don't like DRM because it controls what you can do with essentially software that you've bought. Um, which is another bit of a, a weird sort of, you know, there's a whole debate about whether you truly own software because you really get a license to use software and all that sort of thing. Um, but DRM-free games means we trust you not to give this game to other people. Uh, and, and honestly, the only game that I have given to somebody else that I got DRM-free is RimWorld. And that was because the person who I gave it to wasn't sure if they wanted to play it. So I gave them one of my five free copies that you get for each version, and they went, this is great, I'm buying it. So from a, from a very personal, very limited set of uh, data points, I can confirm that, that DRM-free actually increases revenue rather than, <laughs> rather than doing anything <laughs> that reduces. Well, just to go back to the Humble Bundle for a second, I actually managed to get this bundle before Nuclear Throne sold out. So um, if we actually do what we keep talking about and share our Steam libraries, you can get it that way. Have we not done that? Uh, no, not officially. I can still play Nidhog. Oh, really? Yeah, Oh, wait. I installed it. Oh, OK. So we must have done it on your PC, but not mine. Uh, in which case, yeah, I'll, I'll unlock Nuclear Throne. Uh, actually, I might as well do it now. And then you can play it. But um, I was going to say that the bundle actually is pretty much worth it 
I think even if you do own a bunch of the games, like the only one I really wanted that I was interested in was The Witness. Um, oh, I saw that. And I think 20 quid for The Witness on its own is pretty, pretty good. What is this? Europa Blown, Strange Island Full of Puzzles. I do like puzzle games. That reminds me. Nine Worlds. Jen. Yeah. We should tell the listeners. I was going to say viewers. <laughs> no. Uh, the listeners about Nine Worlds because it's rad and awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone must attend. Everyone must attend Nine Worlds. It's going to be on the 7th of August. Jen, it's the, the what of August? The 4th? <laughs> yep, that weekend. That weekend. It's a, a massive nerd fest, but not in the not in the sex way. Fourth um, to sixth. Fourth to sixth of August. There's going to be, you know, there's going to be talks. There's going to be panels. There's going to be cosplay. Is there a cosplay competition? Yeah. So if you cosplay, so when you get your registration pack, there are cosplay tokens, and um, you give them to people who you think have got cool cosplays. There's no formal like parade or anything. It's a lot more like chills and that. It's a lot nicer and less pressury. Um, so if you get, I think it's this year, 25 cosplay tokens, you get prizes. Prizes? Yeah. Points mean prizes. Um, yeah, and it's got a big focus on inclusivity, which is very much what Jen's into because, yep. uh, you know, a lot of the, the charity is about people who are excluded from, from, I suppose, many things in many different ways. In all the ways that you could prob- possibly be excluded from something, Jen's around to try and get you included in something. Uh, so it's... You sound like a superhero. Yeah. <laughs> the includer. Inclusion girl. <laughs> um, Inclusion yeah. gender is a fluid state. That was going to be a joke that I completed. <laughs> Just fumbled it. <laughs> What's the word I was looking for? Oh, God. Uh, Do you want to think about it while we continue talking? What's Spectrum? Oh my god. <laughs> Spectrum. Yeah. Yes. So uh yeah, it's it's very inclusive for basically anybody. And honestly, we have had a lot of um really good feedback about how people who are normally uh, very reticent to express their inner selves have found it a really open place and, and uh well inclusive and, and tolerant. Uh, and people have felt that they can wear what they want and behave how they want as long as it's not, you know, badly. Um, but the point is, we're going to be doing a mystery desk. Yeah. So um, last year's mystery desk happened by accident. This year, it's a full-on mystery desk. Um, so I'll be running a desk where you can come and say hi. Um but also you get to do quests and solve riddles and all sorts of puzzles and things and get prizes. So there's going to be, yeah, there's going to be lateral thinking type riddles and there's going to be logic type puzzles. Again, inclusivity is good. Uh, and, and the prizes are going to be basically done in terms of the cosplay tokens as well. So if you want, if you didn't want to cosplay because you didn't feel doing so, you can do some logical puzzles. You can do some uh, riddle puzzles get cosplay tokens that way and still get a prize. That is going to be at the... Jen, what's the name of the venue? It's probably going to be the Novotel in um, Hammersmith. Hammersmith. Hammersmith Novotel. It's actually quite a nice place. It's got a nice checkered entrance room floor. (laughs) So if you like black and white tiles, definitely come along to see those. That is a very Uh, random reason. Look, (laughs) If you have, it, it basically means this is a clean bit. <laughs> Do you not notice how anything that's got black and white tiles is supposed to be clean? Like kitchens and things? Plus, I mean, don't um, underestimate the tiled enthusiast audience. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's all about inclusivity. <laughs> and I mean, if you think of the Venn diagram of people interested in our podcast and people interested in tiles, it's a large crossover group. <laughs> Yeah, it's going to be the sort of people who install the more floors mod for RimWorld because they want the tile options. Like me. You know, I really like having checkered tiles. So I, I was I was saying that as a joke, but actually genuinely you, you are the audience. <laughs> I am my own audience. <laughs> now look. Learn something we, um, every we, time. We are our own audience. 
<laughs> this is how I I say this in my videos a lot, and I actually say it to people who haven't watched my video. That, that yeah, we've got about forty four subscribers right now on YouTube, and maybe about five or six of them will watch any video, which is actually a fairly decent amount considering I don't really advertise it. But I record the videos because I'm playing the game, not because I want people to watch the videos. Although it's nice when they do. Yeah. So. Essentially, I'm playing it because I want to, and I'm saying what I want to say, which almost literally makes me my own audience. <laughs> because the only other people who are going to be entertained by my videos are people who are me in a different shell. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. So you kind of have to do these things for yourself. Because if you try and aim at a different audience, which I guess it's, it's a skill, because if we didn't aim at audiences that weren't yourself, then we wouldn't have children's books. Yeah. It, so some people need to be able to do that. But I don't need to. I'm just putting shit out there on the internet. And if people want to listen to it, people want to listen to it. And if they don't, then, you know, more than 99.9 recurring percent of people on the planet fall into that category of people who don't want to listen to it. But those seven people who do continue to. And I continue to do what I'm doing with me as my audience, so we're going to continue to do this with us as our audience, and then anybody who is friends of us had better be listening to it, because if mm -hmm. they don't like it, we would have to unfriend them on Facebook. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm kind of, I mean, I haven't done any videos for a while, but the whole reason I'm doing this podcast is just because I've always wanted to see what it was like, like, and also I really... This is why I'm the one that did the show notes and why I'm talking about audacity and shit like that. I love trying to figure out how stuff works and having a project like how do you do a podcast is really fascinating to me. So, yeah, I don't care if anyone listens to it or not. I mean, I'm enjoying myself. <laughs> I like I always seem to like to do things that could turn into a blog post. You know, yeah. if you if you want That's to do something of it, yeah. and then you look on the Internet and you go. There's so many resources and they don't just tell me what I need to know. So you do it yourself, figure it all out, condense it into a blog post in theory, write it down, and then you have produced, you, you have been the change you want to see. Yeah. Which I, I understand from good sources it is a good attitude to have. <laughs> um, I do it with a technical blog, mostly because people ask questions on the internet on technical channels. And I go, why do people keep asking this question? Obviously, they can't find the answer. I will write the answer. But in, in the cases of things like this, it's not things I've done before, but I did write a blog post about how I created the videos using free software, basically. Not all of it capital F free, but all of it unpaid, legitimately unpaid for, except yeah. for the games themselves. You know, if you wanted to start doing a YouTube channel, you don't need to spend any money except on the game that you probably already own because otherwise you wouldn't want to do the channel in the first place. And just go, you know, YouTube's free and everything that I use to record is free. And usually just works unless you've got Jen's computer. <laughs> yep. Which is an HP, right? Yep. Which is, you know, kind of par for the course if you buy HP. Yeah. <laughs> you always Hardware learn that won't them. allow you to do anything free. <laughs> which is DRM. Mm. In fact, I can't remember how long ago it was, but it was quite a long time ago. There was this... Um, I think they call it a cartel, basically, of the big uh, technolo technology companies, Microsoft, Intel, all that sort of thing. And they started to implement something called trusted boot system or something, where the boot hardware in your computer would check the operating system and refuse to run the operating system if it wasn't recognized by the hardware, which, because Microsoft were involved in, meant that you would not be allowed to run anything except for a legitimate copy of Microsoft Windows on the hardware, which is pretty difficult because Microsoft Windows tends to complain if you you know, change your graphics card or something like that. There are, you can make enough changes to a computer that Windows will go, this is a new computer, you need to buy a new license. Whereas, of course, what you should be doing is installing free capital F software that you can just use royalty-free as much as you like, but because of this cabal of companies trying to get all the all your money, uh, they tried to lock down the hardware to force you to use Microsoft software, and people didn't really like that. Hmm. Um, but this HP thing is kind of a 
sort of a roundabout way of doing that. It's more of an incompatibility problem, but HP did it on purpose, as far as I can tell, which is why we prefer things to be free and open, because we can see when people are doing, you know, distrustful things. Yeah. Speaking of, I meant to send you this. Um, I know I recommended, um, I don't know if you're still using it, HitFilm for a free video editor. There's also an open source one now called Caden Live, K-D-E-N-L-I-V-E. -E, I think you uh, did send it to me and I haven't tried it yet. Oh, okay. Um, I looked at it and it is actually, um, the KDE part is actually the KDE desktop environment that you get on Linux um, distribution. Yeah, so it was originally a Linux program, but it's just recently come to Windows. Yeah, and there is a, yeah, Caden Live 16.12.1 release with Windows version in January the 13th, 2017. So that's really cool. Mm -hmm. um, this is the sort of thing we need more of in the world. When we were at FOSDEM, we learned about lots of initiatives, basically, to bring less common uses into the free and open software world. We were looking at a place called MuseScore, M-U-S-E, score, S-E-O-R-E, -E, um, which is a, I think it's a website, but it's also a piece of software which allows you to create, uh, you know, musical scores using free and open source software, which can be trans transcribed into, you know, free formats to be sent around the internet, some of which is on their website so that you can browse music on their website and even play it through the browser all using completely free stuff so that you can then um, create your own tools and utilities that can you know, play around with music, re-render it. Um, some of the things they were talking about is that you can have, uh, there's a, a Braille music uh, language, basically. So you can get the music that MuseScore has created, get it for free because the format is open, and then plug it into a Braille reader, which can use various ways of displaying Braille for, for blind people to read the music. Yeah. However, it does not work on a Braille note from experience. A Braille note? Yeah. My uh, childhood best friend um, is visually impaired, and uh, we really struggled in school with trying to get Braille music on a Braille note. We had to have it typed out by a massive machine. But that is then because the Muse score project is only recently even remotely mature. So I guess the trade-off with free and open source software is at some point somebody has to write it. Yeah. yeah. It's always going to be written in people's spare time or as a result of um, donations that fund them to do it in their not spare time. So if it was to work on a Braille note, you'd have to have somebody to write the software to convert it into Braille note compatible data. So if nobody has, it's not going to work. But there's a chance that by now somebody has. Mm. And, that, you know, there were many other things that people were doing to use this musical software to produce different outputs of the same information, i.e. the musical score. So this Caden Live thing is another step in the right direction because it's free and open source. Ultimately, it became fairly easy to create it for Windows uh, with, I guess, only a, a few tweaks or at least... I guess the hardest thing here is that because it wasn't originally written for Windows, then all the controls and things that you would see on the screen would suddenly look rubbish because it would be using the Windows ones and they wouldn't fit. And, you know, user interface is actually the hardest part of software to write usually. Mm. Um, but this is a step in the right direction for movies rather than music. Yeah. Well, I've been looking around at a lot of this stuff recently. There's one I found called Krita, K-R-I-T-A, which is a Photoshop replacement. And that kind of thing is really cool because Photoshop is a, any kind of Adobe thing at the moment just seems to be a pain in the butt because you have to get this subscription service. I'd rather just pay them up front, even if it's a ton of money. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, we're coming up on an hour and a half. I think we might want to wrap soon. Okay. Is there anything you wanted to cover before we uh, whistle? We still don't have a bloody them. name. Well, maybe maybe our audience will help out. Something tangential to tangents. Hmm. Uh, cosines? Was that a maths joke? It might have yeah. been. <laughs> no wonder we didn't get it. Jen got it. Yeah. I just. Oh, no wonder I didn't get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Cosines suppose... doesn't seem particularly podcasty. 
tangential to tangent would be the radius, right? Yeah. There you go. I don't know. What? There you go what? <laughs> radius is... So what, radius, radius gaga. Radius cast. Rad radio. Radio, is that a word? Radio cast. I, I don't think anyone's used radio before. Let's try that. <laughs> I'm sure we'll think of something between now and the time that I've finished uploading the third or fourth episode. Right? Yeah. Sure. Maybe people will suggest something. Maybe we should go with listen. you and I say for the time being until we find something. Look, either people listen and suggest stuff or don't listen and it doesn't matter. Because <laughs> if no one's listening to it, it doesn't matter what it's called. All right? It is true. Seems fair. All right. Well, I think we had uh, a good amount of... Um, yeah, I, think you, you, I mean, we've got an hour and a half. You can probably edit that down to like a quality 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> of silence. Yeah. <laughs> Just Jen shuffling her laptop. And eating food. Yep. Ugh. <laughs> Could be one of those like ASMR casts <laughs> by Nora. Yeah, just, we well, need. we got your breathing deeply into the microphone part. So just do it closer and deeper. <sighs> like that. <laughs> and that's blowing, James. No blowing. <laughs> <laughs> the wind, my only friend. I hate you. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> That's still my uh, favourite joke, I think, ever. <laughs> you mean you think it was a joke? Sure. See, never quite sure if things are jokes. Which is the correct form of comedy. Have we finished? So, speaking of not being able to end something, <laughs> let's uh, let's fade out here. Okay. Maybe we'll fade out into one of Kevin MacLeod's... Uh, fade out. Just like gentle elevator music. Dun, 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 dun.